we're going to be looking today here in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, as we pick up and continue our series in the gospel of Mark. And so I'll share this with you real briefly, then we'll get into our study. We, um, I normally like to lay a foundation. I'm going to give to you a thorough foundation as we go into this particular passage that deals with the blessing of infants. We'll be looking at that in some detail. And so what I'll do is I'll give you some information that will help you to put this into some kind of context. And, and then we'll go into the verses one at a time. And at the conclusion, just letting you know in advance, I'll be sharing a few things that I think are important for us as a church to be aware of uh, in terms of contemporary issues that relate to, to children. You'll see that in, uh, in a few moments. But beginning here in Mark chapter 10 at verse 13, reading to verse 16, Mark writes, Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will, by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. So during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jews from a very early age were taught the scriptures. They were taught the scriptures because scripture is God's revelation, and the community of Jews emphasized the learning of it from very, very young age. When we were in Israel recently, our, our, uh, our guide, his name was Adrian. Adrian was sharing with us these things. He was sharing how literate the nation of Israel was during the time of Christ. He shared with us that uh, the parents had a particular way of ministering to the children and things of that nature. And he said it was such, it caused such interest in me that when I got home and knowing the passage I was going to be sharing with uh, you on Sunday morning, I did a little bit of extra research related to the things he was saying and discovered that as he was sharing those things that, that he obviously was telling us exactly the truth. And, and so I, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of what he gave to us. Some of you who went with us to Israel will remember this. So scripture was looked at by the Jews as the revelation of God. The community of Israel emphasized the learning of the Bible from a very early age. And that would be in obedience to what God had said in the history or the early history of the nation. You can look in the book of Joshua in chapter 1, verse 8, and you see this. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it reads, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So Joshua had been inspired by the Spirit to record these things, to say these things. And it was because in the meditation and obedience to the Word of God, your life is going to be blessed. He said, you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. What are you to do? You're to observe to do it and meditate on it. So from the very early age of the uh, nation of Israel to the time of Christ, the study of the scriptures was very important. The Jews knew that they were to reject the influence of the pagan world. They knew that. They knew that the pagan world's influence would take them away from their, their love and service to God. They were aware of that. And so they, they made a practice, the, the community made a practice of knowing and observing God's law. They did this because God had told them in his word that that was what they were to do. God had called them his own special people, and he had called them to be separate from all other nations, the nations that rejected him. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 6, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. In Deuteronomy 22, 16, rather 18 through 19, it says, The Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared 
He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor high above all the nations he has made and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. He said you are to keep his commands. He said you're coming out of all the peoples. You are to be a people holy to the Lord. So they're to be a people holy to the Lord. They come out of the peoples and they keep his commands. Now, because of this, Jewish parents took great pains to, to educate their children in the Bible. Jewish historian Josephus, who lived from 37 to 100 AD, said this. He wrote, our chief ambition, our chief ambition is for the education of our children. We take most pains of all with the instruction of children and esteem the observation of the laws and the piety corresponding with them the most important affair of our whole life. Now that to me is amazing. Just to read that. What is the most important thing in your children's life? He says, the instruction of our children, the esteem of the observation of our laws, the holiness or the piety corresponding with them is the most important affair of our whole life. And so because of this, from early childhood, children were taught, but they were not simply spoken to, they were taught to memorize scripture. As soon as a child was old enough to speak, that child was taught two scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And Deuteronomy 33, verse four, Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. From the very beginning, from the time they were small, they were given scripture. At the age of five, they began to memorize scripture. They actually would memorize, <laughs> this is amazing. They actually began by memorizing the first five books of the Bible, word by word. The first five books of the Bible, the children were taught to memorize word by word at the age of five. They later on, memorized oral tradition, then later the written traditions. By the age of 15, they were ready to set out on their own, either in marriage or in labor. Our uh, guide said, you may be surprised, but the apostles were much more steeped in the word of God than you may think. He said the average Jewish male between the ages of 13 to 15 was ready to set on, on their own life. Young women, the women of Israel during the times of Christ and a little before, the young girls would get married at the age of 13 or 14, sometimes as young as 12. When we look at movies, we see movies that are portraying the uh, birth of Christ and Mary, his mother, we have a tendency of thinking that, uh, that uh, Mary was like an 18, 19, 20, 25-year-old woman. No, she was probably 13 or 14. They were young but they had already been steeped in the word of God. From the age of five, they were memorizing scripture. That's why the apostles, when you see John and James, and it says they were fishermen and they worked for their father, he said, you may be surprised, but they were probably younger than you think they were. He said, they could have been 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. He says, you picture them, some, sometimes we do. We picture them as kind of older people, but in fact, they, they really more than likely weren't. They were more than likely younger than we think, and they were steeped in Scripture. A lot of times, again, we say, well, they were just humble fishermen or, or a tax gatherer or, or, or whatever, political uh, zealot. But these were people who actually were steeped in Scripture. They memorized it from the age of five. They knew traditions. They knew the things that related to those things in a way that, that today it really puts us to shame when you consider that because they memorized the scripture. That's why Jesus could say, have you not read? And in saying that, he didn't even have to cite unless he said, Moses said, but they were familiar with this. They just needed to learn what it was fulfilled. It was fulfilled in Messiah. It was to be demonstrated through Jesus Christ. And he came to give them insight to teach them in a way that they had yet to learn. But they were well versed in scripture. All of those men that he called would have known the word of God very well. Well, see, during the time of Christ, the Pharisees, uh, the, uh, the most influential religious group of the day, there were the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees, and then they had subgroups like that, Herodians and all. 
But the Pharisees were small in number. Some estimate that they had around 6,000 or so that were known as Pharisees during the time of Christ. And most of their activity would have been centered in Jerusalem by the temple. That's why sometimes when we're reading, it'll say some Pharisees traveled to see him. That's because they're coming more than likely from the south, though there were Pharisees up in the north where Jesus did a lot of his ministry too. But the Pharisees had set up a works righteousness kind of system. And so in doing so, they didn't think that children were really that important, not at an early age, because they couldn't really, with depth or a great comprehension, understand the nuances of the law. They, they didn't have that capacity, and they couldn't do good works because they were small, and so they didn't give a whole lot of attention to the little ones because since they didn't know the law and, and they couldn't really perform good works, they would be overlooked. So in ministering to these children, Jesus was illustrating that salvation is actually a, a, a work of grace, a grace on the part of the Lord, but not good works by man. So these children, though they were unable to comprehend or to keep the law, they still have great value. Why is that? Well, for many reasons, including that they represented the future of the Christian faith, which I call the Jesus movement. And a lot of times people speak of the Jesus movement as being a movement here in the United States that began in the late 60s into the early 70s. But no, the Jesus movement began with Jesus. And so this was the beginning of the Jesus movement. And he wants to have the faith, uh, the faith that is, is deposited in him to be transmitted through generations until he, until he takes the church to be with him. So these, these were the ones, these infants and these toddlers were actually being influenced and blessed by this great rabbi because they are, are very important for his movement to continue until he returns. And, and so that's what what uh, we're seeing here in this passage. Now, remember, uh, before we were looking at the sanctity of marriage, the question had been related to divorce and all. And so Jesus had spoken about divorce, but now he moves into speaking concerning children. And at least that's how Mark has chronologically ordered this for us so that we can see the connection between uh, how important marriage is and how important it is when in marriage you have your children. And so... Part of the purpose of marriage was to have children who praised and worshiped God. That was part of his original intention and part of his, his instructions in the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, in chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. It, it reads, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Be fruitful, he said, and multiply. So he begins with marriage as an institution with the command to be fruitful and multiply, to have generations that follow. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. And in Malachi chapter 2, verse 15 we read, has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So the purpose of marriage, at least one of the purposes of marriage, is to have godly offspring, to communicate faith in God to future generations. So the Jewish nation knew the value of their children and overwhelmingly still do. And they recognize that children are a gift given to them from God. Well, we do too, but sometimes we, we wish that we could re-gift them to somebody else. But the children were known to be a blessing. In Psalm 127, verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And they knew that. They knew that God gave to them children. They knew they had a responsibility to communicate the faith of God to the future generations, and they recognized the value. Now, these people who are bringing these children obviously love their children. They're bringing them to Christ. Now, during this time, Jewish parents would desire their children to be blessed by a great rabbi, and it was common for them to bring their infants to be blessed on their first birthday. Normally, they would be brought to the local synagogue or to a very prominent rabbi. Well, in this case, they brought their infants to Jesus that he might bless them. 
Now that gives us insight into something about Jesus' personality. It shows us that he cared for children, and it shows us that they cared for him. So that reveals something to us. It reveals that he wasn't a grumpy, stuffy, joyless, religious person. You know, because sometimes old men, you know, people like myself, are, are looked at as the people who stand on the porch and yell at kids, get off my lawn, you know, that guy. Jesus wasn't that at all. It's been said that he was somebody who radiated joy and love and, and peace and kindness and, and it was something that was very attractive. There was a commentator by the name of George MacDonald, and he said, I believe, I do not believe in a man's Christianity if children are never to be found playing around his house. And so Jesus was likable, lovable. He, he, he had this, this, this sense of, of, of kindness and welcoming spirit, and, and the children would feel very comfortable with him. We already saw in chapter 9 how that Jesus had taken a little child in, in his arms as he was teaching. Well, this gives us a picture of his gentle kindness and, and the loving way in which he carried himself. So with that in mind, Mark is telling us that children are being brought to Jesus. Now, earlier, this kind of thing had been brought to our attention. In Matthew 19, verse 13, Matthew had said, little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and prayed. So they're seeking a blessing from the Lord. Mark 9, 13 says they brought little children to him. Now, I want to look at this for just a moment. Mark uses a word for children that can speak of an infant, but it also includes a young child. That's the Greek word that Mark chose to use that communicates to us that it's from infancy to uh, young childhood. But Luke 18, verse 15, uses a different word. The word he chose to use under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit speaks of an infant. It speaks of a child in arms. So that reveals something important to us. These fathers, these mothers, siblings, these friends, they had faith in Christ. And they wanted these children to know God. They wanted these children to be part of his kingdom. They had been blessed by him, and they desired their babies to be blessed also. And so it helps us to understand, look, if we have been blessed by God, we should desire our children to be blessed by our God also. I think one of the things that is a failure in the movement that I was saved in, again, I mentioned the, the Jesus movement as it's referred to by church historians and all from the times of the late 60s till the very early 70s, if there's one thing that my generation of Jesus freaks uh, failed to do, many failed to take the faith that they claimed to have and to give it to their children. Many did. Many failed to communicate the faith of Christ to their babies. And that's one of the things that we had been commanded to do that I think we have failed at. We need to bring our children, those of us who have par our parents or those of us who have grandchildren also, we have a responsibility. I'll share with you about that in a moment. But we have that responsibility to bring them to faith in Christ. Like I was sharing earlier, how Josephus said the most important thing to a Jewish person is, is to, to educate them in the ways of God. And, and I think sometimes we have forgotten that. You see, our kids can't bring themselves to the Lord these kids certainly couldn't. They, they were too young to do so. They needed someone who loved them and cared about them to bring them to Jesus. It's like what it says in Ephesians 6, verse 4, where, where Paul said it like this. He said, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Instead, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, that's my responsibility. Now, as these, these people are bringing these children infants and even toddlers and all young children, as they're bringing them to Christ, what is it that the apostles do? Well, notice how it says in verse 13, it says they rebuke those who brought them. That word rebuke means to, to forbid or reprimand. It, it speaks of admonishing. So they're, they're rebuking them for bringing these children. So we need to be very careful not to think unkindly, unkindly of the disciples. We need to take this response in some context. 
Jesus has been teaching them that he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's been telling them that he's going to die. He's on his way to the cross. He knew it, and so did they. His disciples are trying to free him from disturbances that they think are unneeded at that moment. And so rebuking the people and doing so, they thought they were freeing him from distractions. Yes, Jesus knew he's about to die, yet he still took time to minister. And he took time to hold them in his arms, to smile upon them, to bless them. But his men wanted to protect his time and his energy. They're not sure about what's taking place, and they have a tension in their hearts. And these people are bringing Christ, these children, and they see it as an intrusion. They see it as inconvenience. Now, it may be a reflection of their being influenced by the attitudes of the Pharisees, but the response to this reveals that they once again are misunderstanding Jesus' nature. You see, in caring for these kids, he's, he's going to leave an indelible mark on the heart of the parents. They're going to remember bringing their children to this great rabbi who blessed them, and it also is leaving an indelible mark in the heart of the babies. And this is the, the future that he's really, uh, he's really uh, securing because these children, some of the toddlers may very well remember how this great rabbi Jesus had, had prayed for them and blessed them. And most certainly the, the parents will understand that. And that would be something that would motivate them, provoke them in their future to, to remind the children of what Jesus had done. But his men are displeased. His men are upset. So how does Jesus respond to what his men are doing? Well, verse 14, it says, when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. And he said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Let them come to me. Well, it says that he was displeased. That word displeased speaks of anger, outrage, or indignation. It's a strong word. He grew indignant over the behavior of the disciples. He became angry because he loved children, and he loved those who were bringing these kids to him. He didn't get angry. Notice with me. He didn't get angry with the people. He got angry with his men. Their reaction was closing the door on his opportunity to minister to the people. And these men still didn't understand that, that Jesus had come to bless them. Now, recently, Jesus had used a child as a living illustration. He had taken a small child in his arms, and, and that should have revealed something to them about Jesus and his ministry. It showed them that Jesus was the kind of man who cared for kids and that children cared for him. And that's why in verse 14, he says, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. Don't hinder children from coming to me. Why? Well, for of such is the kingdom of God. Of such is the kingdom of God. What is it about children? We've already looked at this a bit before in chapter 9. I'll remind you of a couple things. What is it about children that characterizes the person who follows Christ? What is required for a person to become a follower of Christ? Jesus said... For of such is the kingdom of God. Well, one, children are dependent and helpless. They're unable to bring themselves to Jesus. These children didn't come to him on their own. Somebody brought these children to him. That underscores the importance of the transmission of faith to the next generation. There's a, a fellow by the name of Robbie, Robbie Lowe, and he, he was writing for a magazine called Touchstone, Touchstone Magazine, and he wrote an article, The Truth About Men and the Church. The Truth About Men and the Church, Touchstone Magazine, Robbie Lowe. He said, if a father does not go to church, no matter how faithful his wife's devotion, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper. If a father does go regularly, regardless of the practice of the mother, between two-thirds and three-quarters of their children will become churchgoers, regular as well as irregular. If a father goes only irregularly to church, regardless of his wife's devotion, between a half and two-thirds of their offspring will find themselves coming to church regularly or occasionally. The influence of the father is that great. 
Mama can be the greatest saint, most loving, most devoted. Mama could be the greatest prayer warrior. Mama can do the devotions. Mama can go to church regularly. Mama can serve. But the kids aren't necessarily looking at mama. The kids are looking at the father. The kids are looking to see what dad's faith is all about, how God, how God has moved in their father's life. And I'll tell you, I came from a generation, I think the generation continues to exist in this generation, that is that, that men thought it was the responsibility and duty of the wife to go to church. But for the man, he stayed home to mow the lawn, drink a beer and watch a game. That's what I was raised in. That's how a lot of us in my generation, and I think that generation continues to this day, if at all, where the father thinks that the responsibility of the children's faith really is hinging on the wife, when in fact that's not practically true, that's scripturally not true. And, and Robbie Lowe points that out. He says, no, if the father is devoted, the children have a tendency of follow, following their father and the father's devotion. So valuing our children is revealed by our emphasis of faith in, in their lives. It, it's the parents' responsibility to bring them up in the ways of the Lord. I, I've told my kids, I've said this before, I'll repeat it very briefly to you now. Some of you have heard me say this more than once, but it's true. My children will, when they were young, and even to this day, it's my birthday or it's uh, Christmas some occasion, or they actually open their wallet to give me something. It's at least once a year. Um, but they'll ask, they'll say, Dad, what do you want? What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for your birthday? They do it all the time, every year at least. What do you want? I always have said the same thing. I've never said anything different. I'm, I'm telling you the truth when I say this. I'll say this. I'll say, you know what I want. When they were little, I would say, what, is, what do I want? What do you want, Daddy? I want you to follow the Lord. I want you to follow the Lord. What do you want, Dad? I want you to know Jesus. I've said that since they were infants, since they were able to ask, what do you want? I want you to follow Jesus Christ. See, I can afford my own gifts. Not only that, when they were young, I paid for my own gifts. <laughs> they weren't out there working. They weren't out there mowing the lawn as toddlers. You know, I can do this, no. No, I was giving money to them through my wife, who's very generous with my money. <laughs> so it's true. From the very beginning, I know a lot of you fathers probably are pretty similar, if not the same. What do you want? What do I want? I want you to be honest. I want you to be virtuous. I want you to be good. I want you to be a good father or a good mother. What do I want? I want you to follow God. I want you to follow Jesus Christ. I want you to go to heaven because, see, it won't be heaven for me if you're not there with me. I want you to know Jesus Christ. What do I want? I don't need your gifts. You want to buy me something? You can't afford what I'd really want. <laughs> buy, me a, buy, me a, buy me a Cobra, 1967, 427, 475 horsepower. Buy me that. You can't? Then love the Lord. <laughs> hey, come on. You can't afford what I'd want. But you can have what I'd want. You can have faith in Christ. That's what I want. And that is not something just that I say. That's what the Jews knew, and that's what the church was taught. Fathers, raise your children to know God. That's what Paul said. Don't exasperate them. Bring them up in the knowledge and nurturement of Jesus Christ. That's what you're to do. Why? Because fathers have that tremendous impact, an impact that even mama as wonderful and unbelievable as she is, even mama doesn't have the impact a father does. So love the Lord and care for your children is what we're to do. And we're to train them up. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child. That word train is a word that speaks of provoking. It was a word that was used to describe what a midwife, a Hebrew midwife would do when a child parted the womb and the Hebrew midwife would get date honey. And when the baby had parted the womb, she would put the date honey on the lips of the newborn infant. 
and it would provoke the sucking reflex so that the baby would nurse. So the Hebrew midwife would provoke them. And that word provoke, train up a child, provoke a child is what we're to do. We're supposed to give to them a taste for the things of God. As newborn babies, we want them to desire the pure milk of the word that they may grow thereby. And so it's our responsibility to do that. We provoke them. We're to encourage our our children to desire the milk of the word of God. In the Jewish home, the mother would minister to her infant while she was nursing. The mother would pray. She would sing songs. She would quote simple Bible verses to the baby as she nursed and and loved her her little one. And she'd she'd do this as the baby was was, uh, small and growing. But when the child began to speak, the father took over the training of the child. And that's when the father began to teach the child prayers and, and, and scripture and, and, and basic doctrine. That's when that started taking place. And what that was intended to do, and, and church, we need to understand this. It's, it's so needed today. Is this, this pouring into them the word of God, the memorization of scripture, and, and being that example to them produced in those Jewish children a worldview. That, that was able to discern and distinguish what was from God and, and what wasn't. That's why God said, don't learn the ways of the pagans surrounding you. You're to be a unique people called out. You're to be a light in a dark place. Don't intermarry with them. Don't go into their culture. Don't be like them because you have been called to be kings and priests in my kingdom. That's what children are supposed to understand themselves to be. That comes through us. In Proverbs 4, verses 11 through 13, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her. She is your life. That's what we are to teach, our way of life is to give, to be given to the children. And our way of life is the pattern that will help to establish our children's way of life. So what are they to do? They're to be cared for in this way. Secondly, we know things of the small children. Small children trust. They trust their father. They trust their mother. They trust. And as believers, we trust our father you see, they, they believe that what their father or their mother tells them is true. They actually trust them to tell them the truth. In Psalm 31, verse 1, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. I trust you. I will trust in you. I trust you. You keep your word, whether it's for blessing or or whether it's for chastising, you keep your word. I used, when my son David was small, he had done something he shouldn't have done, and I, and I said to him, son, I really should chastise you for this. I should, I should chasten you, not beat him and punish him with an angry spirit, but, but I should give you discipline for this. Lord, uh, you, sh- you should get a, you know, a, the Board of Education should be applied to the seat of understanding in this case. But I said, I'm going to teach you something, son. I'm going to teach you grace. You should be receiving ju- judgment, but I'm going to give you grace because God gives me grace. I'm giving you grace. He did it again. I said, no, it's time for judgment. <laughs> Do it once, not twice. And so another thing, a third thing about small children is they respond to love. You know, those of us who have children, those of us who I'm at that point where I bless God because he's given me grandchildren. Um, there's just something about that. We have our grandbabies and, and we, we love them. All of our grandbabies, we, we love them. And I've had the joy and privilege and blessing of, of having my grandbabies around me a, a lot. And, and, uh, and I love them to pieces and they know it. They know it. It would have been kind of good if I could, could have skipped the kids and had the grandkids, but it didn't work that way. So I love my grandbabies, and they love me. Uh, my, my grandson, Josiah, just got a car, and, and I wrote uh, something about congratulations. He's 18. He'll be 19 pretty soon. And so 
I, I wrote and said something, and his mother, m my daughter Corinne wrote, and she said, Daddy, she says, he loves you. He loves you. I think he loves you more than he loves me, <laughs> as it should be. And so, <laughs> you know, but they're easy to love, and they respond to it. You know, I have my, my Olivia and my Nora, two of my young babies, and and my, my Olivia will say to, to Marie and me, she says, God bless you, God keep you, I love you. God keep you, God bless you. You know where she got that? She got that from her dad. You know where her dad got that? He got that from us. Because whenever I would drop Joseph, Joseph off, his, her father, when I would drop Joseph off for school, because every, every morning, we, they didn't walk to school. Every morning, we drove them to school. They didn't like it when they were seniors in high school, but we did it anyway. <laughs> no, we would take them to school as their kids. And, and when they climbed out of the car, I always put my hand on them or prayed for them. Father, in Jesus' name, keep my children. May they remember who they are, but especially may they remember who you are today and who they represent. I prayed that every day, and they'd climb out of the car, and as they climbed out of the car, I said, God bless you, and God keep you safe. When they go to bed at night, God bless you, may God keep you safe every day of their life. And guess what my Olivia is saying to me now? Papa, I love you. God bless you. God keep you safe. Those are the things that you impart to your children, blessings to them, and, and, and they love being held, and they love being kissed and, and hugged and all of that. And, and they, they will hold on to you. In, in Deuteronomy 13, verse 4, you shall walk after the Lord your God, fear him, keep his commandments, obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cling to him. Hold fast and tightly to him. My children did that also. My grandchildren, one of my grandchildren has a, a lot of love for me, and, and Marie would want to hold her grandchild, and, and I'd be holding the baby, and she would reach to take the baby in so she could hold. I might as well tell you it was Josiah. So she could hold <laughs> Josiah, and I would, I would, I would release. I'd you know, take the baby in. He wouldn't let go of me. He would put his arms tightly around my neck and choke me. And she'd get like, I'm your Grammy, I love you. And I go, <laughs> he's mine. You know, it but they cling to you. And 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 I cling to the Lord. I hold him like my Josiah held me. I, I you know, it, when times are tough and times are rough and and I and you know in in in, in prayer I I have found myself to cling. Well, that's what the scripture says. Serve him, cling to him. Children respond to love and they cling to the one who loves them. A fourth thing is small children believe that their father can do anything. There's nothing that he cannot do. In Jeremiah 32, 17, ah, oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. They believe that. And we ought to believe that with our Father, too. And, and another thing, a fifth thing, is small children are quick to receive a gift. <laughs> they sure are. Children are open to receiving something without working for it. And they do. Now, some adults are close to receiving gifts because they don't trust the one who's giving. But not so with small children. A gift from anybody is just fine. And so to be saved, we receive the gift. That has been offered to us, eternal life through Jesus Christ. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And finally, children imitate their parents. They learn to live as their parents live. What we are very often develops the foundation of who they become. They're immersed in our world and they watch how we respond to life, and they imitate us. In Philippians 4, verse 9, it says, The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So the way you, you teach them, you instruct them, you live before them, they watch you. They watch you. That's why someone so long ago said to a husband, he said, Husband, do your children a favor, love their mother. 
Why? Because the way daddy treats and loves mom is going to be a pattern for a young woman who's saying, I want someone like dad. Or as a young man watching father love mama, and they do watch you. I'm going to love my woman the way my father loves my mom. I told my son David a while back, it's been over a year now, and I mentioned this once before, but I was talking to my son David. He was over the house, and I was talking to David, and as I was talking to him, I said, you know, your mom and I are not really openly, we're not openly, you know, you know, people who like to make out, uh, make out out in the front of everybody, like, come on, you know. We're not that. You know, people on the beach, you're blah, 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 blah. come on, don't. <laughs> you know, don't do that. I, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. So I'm telling Dave, I say, your mom and I, we're not real like openly affectionate. He says, yes, you are, Dad. And I'm looking at him. I said, no, we're not. Yes, you are, Dad. I said, what are you talking about, son? He says, look at you right now. I was sitting on the couch. Marie was sitting a little distance from me, and her foot was on the couch, and my foot was touching her foot. He says, Dad, you're always holding feet. And I said, you know what? I never realized that. He said, oh, no, no, no. You're very, very affectionate to mom. You just do it in a way you think other people can't see. And that's true. But he's watched that. They watch those things. If you're a parent, they watch that. If you're a grandparent, they notice that. They really do. And they use that as a model for how affection is shown, how respect is shown. They watch those things, the way that you live. And so, obviously, it is mine as a parent. It's you who are parents. It's our responsibility to bring our children to Jesus. We, we can think it's the responsibility of the church to instill faith in our kids, but, but it's not. It's a parent's responsibility. As a pastor, the best I can do is give a prepared message and feed you as, as in a spiritual way. My studies are intended to help to clarify what you have read throughout the week. And my teaching isn't going to sustain you any more than one meal is sufficient for your needs. And that's why personal reading of the Word of God is so important. As parents, we can do devotions with the family nightly by just opening the scriptures and having them sit down with us and, and just read a portion. That's what we did when they were small. We would read them the, a portion of scripture. I'd, I'd have the kids sit in front of me and and... You know, I, and the minute I, I would just open the Bible like this, the minute I opened it, they would get quiet because I taught them that when the Word of God is being taught, you are quiet. I taught them that. And I'd let them talk and, and, and you know, fret and everything because he's sitting too close to me. She's looking at me. Those things happen. And I tell Marie, leave the kids alone. But, you know, <laughs> they would do that. And, but the minute I opened the Bible... The minute I opened the Bible, they got quiet because I had taught them, this is God's word. You do not interrupt the reading and teaching of the word of God. You do not do that. This is God's word. That's how I would quiet my kids. I would open the Bible. Boom, they're quiet. I would read them even then when they were tiny and small. I'd read them two, three scriptures. And I'd say, it's always the same study. Blah, blah, blah. Jesus loves you. He wants to save you, and we can love each other. It's always basically that, even in the Word. Every time I gave him the Word, I'd say, do you see what happened with Jesus? Yes. You know what? He did this anyway because he loves you, and we love you, and we need to serve him. Every devotion always came down to loving and serving God, always. And no, you don't have to be a theologian to encourage your children to love and serve Jesus Christ. And, and that's what we would do. And so the, the best I can do as a pastor is encourage and supplement what you're doing uh, on a daily basis. And so we, we need to live in such a way that our words will line up with the way that we live. What we read, what we watch, what we listen to, where we go, what we do, how we treat others, how we fellowship, how we pray, how we share our faith, how we love the Word of God, how we give, how we serve. That becomes the norm that our children grow, grow up in. 
They do what we do, not what we say they should do. There's a, a group that named Casting Crowns who many years ago had a song called Slow Fade. And uh, in one of the lines said, be careful little feet where you go, for it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. And I, I know that for a fact. Many years ago, my son Joseph couldn't have been more than four or five years old at the time, and I've shared this before, but we lived in, uh, in Ontario, and I had torn out all the lawn in our backyard. I was going to reseed it. It started to rain, and so I hadn't uh, reseeded the lawn yet, and, and I had stepped out of the back door, and I was walking across the backyard, and I heard the door slam, so that meant somebody was walking out following me, but I wasn't really aware of who it was. I just was walking, and I heard the, the door close, and then I heard this this grunting sound, this, er, 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 and I thought, what's that? And I turn around, and it's my son Joseph, and, and he's taking these long steps, these exaggerated steps. And I said, son, what are you doing? And he said, I'm following in your footsteps, Dad. I'll never forget that. And the Spirit has a way of speaking to my heart through things like that, and he says, so be careful where you go, because wherever you go, these little feet will follow. Be careful where you go, Daddy. Be careful where you go. One of my sons, the other one, obviously, David, one time said to me, Daddy, when I'm, when I'm big, I want to be just like you. And I said, no, you don't. What you want to be is better than me. Every father should want their children to be better than they are. I want you to be better than me, not me, better than me. That's how I'm raising you. I want you to be better than me. So what we do is we bring our children to Jesus. We, we read them Bible stories. We, we pray with them. We love them. We teach them about God. We invest our time in them. We do all of that, and, and we need to remember that our time with our children is, is ultimately very short. You, you blink, and, and, and before you know it, they're out the door. You, you, it, it feels like just... A moment. It does. Some of you who are older know what I mean. When, you, when, when they're young, you think, are you ever going to leave? And then when they do, you say, are you ever going to come back? Are you ever going to see me? Spend time with me? I miss you. It's true. It's true. And you blink. And you blink. And it's over. That happens. It happens. So we invest in our children. So in considering this passage, what we get is a glimpse of the love of God for children. And it's obvious he desires to save them and protect them from harm. And so I'm going to make a quick comment at this point here that I think is necessary I think it's a, a comment that's appropriate concerning the value of children in general. Obviously, as we built this passage, you've seen that Jesus values children. He even said that to be like, you need to be like one to enter his kingdom. He values children. Well, when I returned from Israel, I was told of a California assembly bill that was being considered it is California Bill AB 2223. It was sponsored by an assemblywoman out of Oakland by the name of Buffy Wicks. And so according to the official Senate analysis of the legislation prepared by State Senate Legislative Director Allison Merrilies, the bill removes criminal liability from mothers in relation to all pregnancy outcomes including the death of a newborn for any reason during the period following birth. The analysis reads, the bill could be interpreted to immunize a pregnant person from all criminal penalties for all pregnancy outcomes, including the death of a newborn for any reason during the perinatal period after birth. The National Center on Health Statistics defines the perinatal period as between 28 weeks of gestation and seven days after birth, but that definition can extend up to 28 days after the child is born. Susan Arnell, 
vice president of legal affairs for the Right to Life League, told the committee during the debate, a mother, her boyfriend, or for that matter, the babysitter, can starve or beat or shake a three-week-old baby to death, and no one can investigate because under the bill, it is a perinatal death. The Sacramento Bee reported that a state legislative analysis confirmed pro-life advocates' concerns about the bill, saying that it could be interpreted to allow infanticide, to allow the killing of babies. The bill passed the Assembly Health Committee in an 11 to 3 vote late Tuesday night. But we can still make our voices heard. I contacted my assemblyman and I registered my rejection of the bill and I asked him to do the same. You can Google AB 2223 and you can find sites that can help you respond. I encourage you to do so. This is infanticide. This is the murder of babies and it's something we the church cannot tolerate. It's something we have to stand in opposition to. And I encourage you all to do that in the name of humanity, but mostly in the name of Jesus Christ. We need to stand in opposition. This is, this, this is not just an outrage. This is where we've gotten. In the Old Testament, there was a, a God called Molech, and the children of Israel were forbidden by God to make child sacrifices to Molech. We have it to this day. It's just called freedom of choice. That's what it's called today. I'll be careful because I'm angry about this because I have beautiful grandbabies. And one of my babies was born a month early, a month early. And in some, some of the laws already on the books, that baby could have been aborted in her eighth month. She could have been aborted legally. That baby was born healthy, obviously needing care because she was a month premature. But I play with that baby every day. Her name's Olivia, every day. And she's the one who says, God bless you, Papa. God keep you safe. I love you. That baby could have been put to death legally in the womb. We, we got to wake up to these things. The church has got to make our voices heard. This is wrong, and we will not stand for it. We will make our voices heard. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I had somebody, somebody called up and was chastising me to one of our secretaries. Why isn't the pastor saying anything? Should have said something on Easter. Well, I didn't know. I was gone. I was in Israel. When I came home, I found out. And so I'm saying it now. I'm saying it now. Contact your assembly person. I contacted mine. You can Google AB 2223. You can find sites that will help you to respond, and I encourage you to do so. I contacted my assemblyman, and I registered my rejection of the bill, and I asked him to do the same. I encourage you to do the same. In verse 16, it says this, and we'll close. He took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. This is how children are to be treated. We love them. We love them. We hold them. And we bless them. By the way, that's why we have baby dedications. You witnessed it today. We ask God's blessing on babies because that's what we're to do. And I want these babies to be raised in the knowledge and love of God so that as we continue in life, these children can be carrying the banner for the gospel. And that people like me one day, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, the Lord's gonna take us home, you know. I'm closer to heaven now than I've ever been. Every day I'm alive is one step closer to him. One day. And I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. But I don't wanna I don't wanna leave Earth without leaving a legacy. And the legacy is going to be followers of Jesus Christ. That's the legacy I want. I don't care if people say, oh, he had a nice car or lived in a nice home, or he had nice shoes for that matter. He had a love for God that he gave to other people, especially to his children.
Ha. Huh. What is the deepest desire of my heart? I'll close with this. It's for my children to know Jesus Christ and for my grandbabies to know Jesus Christ, the greatest desire. It doesn't matter what car I drive. It doesn't matter what house I live in. It doesn't matter how well known I am, how big this church is. The thing that matters to me the most, and you can, you can, I say this before the Lord, is that my kids know Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing in my life that my wife and my children and my grandchildren come to heaven with me. Yes, I want them to know him, but I want them to be with me forever. And the way that happens is if you pay attention to life and pour into them what matters. And what matters is that they love the Lord. What matters is that they know Jesus. I don't care if they become a corporate president. I don't care if they're a multimillionaire. I don't care about any of that. That's garbage. That all perishes. But the one thing that doesn't is their soul. And they can spend the eternity with Jesus Christ. And that's the most important thing. That is. That is. Understand that. The disciples watched Jesus took these children into his arms and he prayed for them. And that's a lesson all true followers of Jesus must learn. Value what he values. Lord, we ask that you would work within us.